What's it like to lose your own body? Welcome, Mere Mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information that is within to extract some themes you might not have thought about and to also read some tragedies. We do have The Diving Bell and the Butterfly by Jean-Dominique Balbi, or Balbi. This book was first published in 1997 and it's relatively thin, 130 pages. It'll probably take you two hours to get through in total. Uh, The writing is rather large on these pages as well. It is a short memoir, very short, describing life with locked in syndrome. So this is basically the syndrome that happens when something happens to your brain right near the stem and actually forces you to lose control of your muscles. So the only thing that you can do is kind of blink and maybe make some facial expressions and move your mouth. You can't talk, you can't move anything. You're basically paraplegic from everywhere, not even just from the neck down, but from everywhere. And so this is what happened to this writer, Jean Dominique. And it's a mix of his personal recollections before the stroke, which happened and caused this to him. Uh, and as well as the day-to-day activities that happened afterwards when he was in the hospital and basically unable to move and only able to communicate via blinking his left eye. So it kind of talks about these very short stories and there's so many of them in here. I can read some of them out at this point. So there's the sausage, guardian angel, the photo, the dream, uh, our very own Madonna outing, loaded for duck, the ladies from Hong Kong, all of these being two to four pages, one page sometimes uh, of journalism or visiting his father or of going to the beach with his family when he was in this locked in syndrome of how they bathe him, communication with the nurses, just random little snippets from here and there of his current life mostly, and then a little glimpses of his previous life. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual author himself. Jean Dominique is French. He was the editor in chief of a magazine Elle, and so was a journalist. And this stroke happened to him at the age of 43 years. Uh, and he lived for about two years before um, dying of pneumonia um, not long after the book was released. And he actually had a book contract before uh, he was he experienced this. And so I guess that was still in effect. And um, how the book was written is rather interesting was it took about 200,000 blinks of his eye and it was about two minutes per word to create. And so how they would do this is they would use the Uh, French frequency alphabet where someone would be there with him and they would read uh, the most common letter in the French alphabet which is E and then I believe it was R or S or T or something like that and uh, uh, Claude Mendebil was I think the person who was um, uh, helping him do this and then you know, it would go E, R, S, T. And then when it was the letter that he wanted, he would blink and then they would write it down and then they would start all over again. And so you can see why it took so long. So basically he created the book in his mind and then would relate this to the person who was helping him to to create it. So um, a very interesting, sad, obviously, but a very interesting style of of writing a book. And um, we can see part of that coming out within the theme. So the first theme is the body trapped within yourself and so I guess like what is the purpose of the body and um, he experiences a rather bitter reality because his body has now left him he has no option of using it and it is very much a burden and so coming over to here on page 65 this is his his life and so it's called my lucky day this morning with first light barely bathing room 119 evil spirits descended on my world For half an hour, the alarm on the machine that regulates my feeding tube has been beeping out into the void. I cannot imagine anything so inane or nerve-wracking as this piercing beep, 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 pecking away at my brain. To make matters worse, my sweat has unglued the tape that keeps my right eyelid closed, and the stuck-together lashes are tickling my pupil unbearably. To crown it all, the end of my urinary catheter has become detached, and I am drenched. Awaiting rescue, I hum an old song by Henry Salvador. Don't you fret, baby. It'll be all right. And here comes the nurse. Automatically, she turns on the TV, a commercial, with a personal computer spelling out the question, were you born lucky? So he was (laughs) 
born lucky, I suppose, but had a very unlucky thing happen to him in his life. And you can see even babies have more autonomy than he does. Uh, and the body, uh, I suppose, can become an expression of the mind. The unfortunate thing for him is he can still feel. So even though he has no control of this, he can feel, you know, the, uh, the um, eyelash tickling him. He can still smell himself drenched in, in urine. He can still feel the discomfort of being in this trapped literally within this body and not being able to satisfy any of its whims by scratching or by using it to express things. And I suppose the question of this is like, okay, if this happens, how do you view this? Is it a challenge to be overcome? Because we're all limited. You know, I, for example, can't control my ears. Some people can do that. Um, there's people who like to meditate for long periods of time. And so voluntarily will enter into a state like him. Um, and you can even see this in the real extreme cases of self-immolation, like happened during the Vietnam War with um, Thich Quang Duc, who basically sat down, poured gasoline all over himself, let himself on, uh, lit himself on fire and, and would just meditated there as um, by a very famous photo. So is there something to be learned from this? You know, what, how do you, how does one approach being trapped in, in your own body? And I suppose you could see it as this challenge type thing, but I mean, the, the thing is that choice is critical, right? Everyone who is doing that chooses to do this. The, the, the monk who burns himself, the meditator, the person who um, is is working on something hard and you know trying to overcome something, a physical limitation. They they all choose to do this. Um, he does not choose this, and so I think the reality of of his position, even though you could maybe go, oh, okay, this is like a challenge to be overcome. Like this is, you know, this happens in your life, and you just got to deal with it, and you know you know, people who lose a limb or something like that, they say, you know, this was the best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me perspective or they get cancer and they overcome it. And it's like, now I have a new lease on life. Well, this is uh, his interpretation of, of what happened. So he's gone to the beach with his family because the, his hospital was right on the beach and they wheel him out to there. And so he's, he's kind of sitting out there able to watch his kids play around um, in the sand. And so, um, but we certainly can play hangman, the national preteen sport. I guess a letter, then another, then stumble on the third. My heart is not in the game. Grief surges over me. His face, not two feet from mine, my son, Theophile, sits patiently waiting. And I, his father, have lost the simple right to ruffle his bristly hair, clasp his downy neck, hug his small, lithe, warm body tight against me. There are no words to express it. My condition is monstrous, iniquitous, revolting, horrible. Suddenly I can take no more. Tears well and my throat emits a hoarse rattle that startles Theophil. Don't be scared, little man. I love you. Still engrossed in the game, he moves in for the kill. Two more letters, he has won and I have lost. On the corner of the page, he completes his drawing of the gallows, the rope and the condemned man. And then we see further on that is his daughter is doing cartwheels on the, hand, on the sand and you know they're living happy and basically... It is truly awful. It is despicable what has gone through him. It is not something you wish upon people. It's not a challenge to be overcome. I mean, it's just absolute claustrophobia beyond belief of the mental strain of non-communication of, uh, it's, it's, it's heartrending. It's, it's, it, it is a true tragedy and you, you can't look at this. I, I, I don't think you, thankfully it is a very rare condition. So not many people that actually ever have to experience this, but it is hard to view it as this is the best thing that has ever happened to me sort of deal. But let's get on to uh, perhaps one positive which comes from this, which is the mind, unlimited possibilities. And maybe something that comes from this is you can kind of dive a little bit deeper into what is consciousness. So he still has inputs, he can still feel, so he does have external stimuli from the world. but what is it if it was just a void what is consciousness uh, because it is very so much something to do with the brain and if you eliminate the body then you really have a, a bit of a closer thing to to what actually it is um, so he is probably closer to the purest expression perhaps of consciousness because he doesn't have the body to move around with and um i suppose it's like 
you know, what what can he do when he's just in his own head, when the, he only has the mind? And so uh, we're well, jumping on to page 44 here. We get a little glimpse of, well, this is actually what he can do at times. So now I cultivate the art of simmering memories. You can sit down to table at any hour with no fuss or ceremony. If it's a restaurant, no need to book. If I do the cooking, it is always success. The bourguignon is tender. The bouffe in gelée, translucent. The apricot pie possesses just the requisite tartness. Depending on my mood, I treat myself to a dozen snails, a plate of Alsatian sausage with sauerkraut, and a bottle of late vintage golden Gewurztraminer. Or else I savor a simple soft boiled egg with fingers of toast and lightly salted butter. What a banquet. The yolk flows warmly over my palate and down my throat. And indigestion is never a problem. Naturally, I use the finest ingredients, the freshest vegetables, fish straight from the water, the most delicately marbled meat. Everything must be done right. And so then he's talking about how he can create these things in his mind, how he can, anything that he imagines, he can live that. He can live these dreams out in his head because there is no other way that he can enact these things. And so his reality becomes whatever he dreams his reality is. A question, and this book raises just a lot of questions for me is, you know, is this possible for for him or is this possible for everyone? You know, if everyone in the world experienced locked in syndrome for, let's say, a year or two years, how many people would be able to experience these sort of things that he does? Or would it be more of a torture? Or for some people, would it be absolute bliss because now they don't have responsibilities in life they don't have to do anything else they can just live in their own head and you know for example did Stephen Hawking become smarter with his version of it his was not as bad as um as Jean Dominique's but with the ability to just think all day and not have to deal with any of the you know sexual frustrations of eating of choosing what to wear of social conventions and things and you can really focus on a particular thing with just your mind can you actually experience anything in the world is is, are you limited only by what you have experienced previously perhaps and so some very interesting questions arise from that and also questions about the future so experience is rather limiting you know i at this very moment have not experienced of what it is like to be in a Brisbane, uh, in a Brazilian favela and going through those streets of feeling the fear of the sights and the sounds. And so if we do have technology in the future that can enable this, would we do that and essentially sort of become like Jean Dominique? And if you think about virtual reality, for example, when you put on those headsets, you're very much limited by the spaces around you and a lot of the problems that occur with them are disorientation of moving around in the world of experiencing things and your body's not physically feeling it so what is it is it better if you just lie down and you can view and feel and sense these things without having to do that essentially becoming somewhat of a Jean Dominique of voluntarily losing your body to get more out of the mind there's some interesting questions related to that and um, I'm very fascinated to see what the future of technology does and if people somewhat voluntarily become like John Dominique has and, and experience, you know, a version of locked in syndrome, albeit with the choice of getting out, which is um, a very nice choice to have. I'm going to jump onto my own observations and takeaways and jumping over to here on page 56. One of the things that's nice about this book is that he still has a, a wry sense of humor. And so uh, I had recently reread The Count of Monte Cristo, and now here I was back in the heart of that book and in the worst of circumstances. This is because one of the characters in the book actually has locked in syndrome as well. Uh, ironic, but that rereading has, had not purely been by chance. I had been toying with the idea of writing a modern, doubtless iconoclastic version of the Dumas novel. Vengeance, of course, remained the driving force of the action, but the plot was take, uh, took, but the plot took place in our era, and Monte Cristo was a woman. So I did not have time to commit this crime of lese majeste. As a punishment, I would have preferred to be transformed into Baron Dungler's Franz de Fernet, the Abbe Faria, or at the very least to copy out 1,000 times. I must not tamper with masterpieces, but the gods of literature and neurology decided otherwise. <laughs> so we can kind of see he was thinking of doing a version, an adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo, 
probably would have butchered it. And so as punishment for even contemplating this, he uh, has to experience the, the feeling of one of the characters in that book. So he does have this humor, which is prevalent throughout the book. He does make things funny. At, at times, not everything is funny, of course, and um, we've heard some of the, the sadder portions just before. Um, but he did seem to be the same person as before, which is, I suppose, a yeah, another question that, that just arises. Are you the same when you can't move your body? Does your personality change? And if he was to regain his body afterwards, would he become who he used to be? Would he then be who he was in his body? Because he certainly would have acted differently you would have to think differently when you're when you're trapped like that and having to endure you know basically if you go through a year or two of torture you're not going to be the same as you came uh, coming out as you came in that's that's pretty much for sure and also another question his will to live what was it that was keeping him alive what was his purpose um you could maybe guess that it was the book itself because he died two days after the publication of this, which is a very kind of coincidental thing. Um, and also asking, did he want to be there? Because I didn't get the sense of much gratitude from him, which is really, um, I suppose, interesting in, in the sense that he is completely dependent on other people. There is, he cannot do a thing to do to survive a baby has more chances of living in the wild than he does. And this is where we can see you'd maybe think, okay, maybe he'd have some gratitude for these people who are just devoting all this time and energy to keeping him alive, to communicating with him. Um, But I I didn't get any of that from this, which makes me then question, did he want to be alive? Um, I don't know what the laws of were like in France of that time of, uh, of being able to you know, I suppose in a sense, commit suicide by asking people to, to not feed you. Is that even suicide? Can you even commit suicide if you're the one not pulling the trigger or taking the action and asking other people to simply not do things? Uh, it's very, it's very tricky. And I, I do wonder how much he wanted to be alive because he was trapped in this body and he didn't really get the option to end it. And there's nothing that he could do to stop his life being continued either. So very, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, let's jump onto my summary. Uh, It's a complete, it's complex series of emotions arise while, while reading this, there's heartbreak, there's mirth, there's absolute horror, and I suppose a fascination all alternating rapidly because his pages and his chapters are so short. Um, It's written in that journalistic editorial style, very much like he used to do with the magazine. So He never gets too deep on anything. It's not a treatise. It's very much small glimpses into his life of what his life has become and in comparison to where he was. Ultimately, I I think it's just a tragedy, to be honest, and it's a reminder to enjoy what you have in in life. And, you know, for that aspect, it might, it's it's probably a book for everyone. Um, I'm not sure there's anyone who needs to read this book as like a full recommendation of who this will, who will get good things from this book? Because uh, I think it's a very hard book to to really to really see the bright side of things. It's an absolute tragedy, a, a awful awful thing to happen to someone. And so, with all of that being said, I'm going to give the book "The Diving Bell and the Butterfly" by Jean Dominique Bobby a six and a half out of ten. Yeah, make of it what you will, but it's um you're not going to come away from this. Uh, super, super happy. <laughs> and so that is it for today, my Memo Lights. Thank you for joining me to the end of this book review. What are your thoughts on the diving bell and the butterfly on locked in syndrome on these topics of the body and the mind? I would love to know all of your thoughts. Best way to do that is via leaving a comment down below, uh, liking, sharing, doing all those sorts of nice things while you're down there is very much appreciated. And I would also just recommend checking out the Mere Mortals podcast. A lot of the themes, a lot of the books we discuss on that channel uh, between myself, Juan, and myself and Juan. And yeah, I really do just hope you're having a, a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Imagine um, a, a reminder to enjoy your body, your expression, your, your movement that you have. And um, until the next time, ciao for now. Kyron out.